Zuckers has a Super 8 camera. And he's filming him. When I stepped down from the plane, he stood in front of me and took my picture. I tried to cover my face. And Kunzel, of course, is absolutely appalled by this because, like any good spy, he doesn't want to be photographed. He then says to uh, Zuckers, hello, Herbert, have you uh, got all your papers to go to Uruguay? Zuckers goes, no, I haven't got them yet. I haven't sort of um, got round to it. I sharply spoke to him and said, if you want business with me, never do this again. Never send me a telegram, you are ready and you are not ready. Kunzel decides, I need to behave like this man's boss. And it's a great bit of bluff, because it works completely. I went on, I say, you send me a telegram to Montevideo, to my hotel. In the meantime, let me prepare a visa. Zuckers eventually gets the paperwork sorted out. Zuckers gets his passport, and then he can fly to Montevideo to meet his good business associate, Mr. Anton Künzel. Before he leaves, Zuckers does something odd. He gives his wife the Super 8 film he took of Kunzel at the airport. Was it because he just wanted, you know, uh, to have some footage of a short, balding, moustached man? No. Zuckers had this cunning. He was always suspicious of Kunzel. Zuckers told his wife, if anything happens to me, this is the man who is responsible. Five months after the Mossad mission was launched, the Latvian Nazi sends word he's flying to Montevideo. He meets the Israeli assassin at his hotel. They check in into the very expensive hotel, which is also part of the plan, you know, to calm down Tsukurs, to show him that everything is going according to plan. From the beginning, Tsukurs had a dual feeling towards Kunzle. On one hand, you know, he saw it as a, as a chancy encounter with an Austrian ex-officer in the Wehrmacht who is a businessman and is promising, promising, promising all kind of good things for the future. On the other hand, Tsukurs was a very clever person. He was alert all the time. He knew that uh, after the war, he will have to pay for his crimes. He knew that he is not innocent. And he was very suspicious. Zuckers is still greedy for money, and even though he's got suspicions about Kunzel, he's going to go along with it because he's desperate for the cash. So he says to Zuckers, look, I really need your advice to help me find a new sort of business premises, a satellite office. So uh, could you help me come and have a look around uh, a few, like, potential buildings we could use as offices? So the two men do a lot of driving around in a VW Beetle, looking at various premises. It's a way of trying to make Zuckers just feel a bit more relaxed. After going around Montevideo for a while, Anton Künzler tells Zuckers, I want to show you another place. This is his last ride to the villa where they're going to execute him. Anton Künzler needed to signal the team that everything is going according to plan. I left the car without enough petrol. I stopped at a certain petrol station. Another member of the team is waiting on the other side of the road. He signaled him that everything is OK. The lookout alerts the hit squad to meet at the house. They took off their clothes because they were expecting to have some kind of a fight. They knew it would not uh, pass without violent reaction from Tsukos. Things could be very messy and very bloody.
Künstler walks first, you know, to show that he's the boss. If I open the door and say, go in, he will not. If I go in, he will come after me. And he's thinking, I can't hear him behind me. Is he, is he going to follow me? Is he suspicious? Is this the moment where suddenly Zuckers runs up to me and just hits me in the back of the head and that's me gone? And eventually he hears footsteps. And Zuckers is, is walking up behind him, and he thinks it's going to happen. She opens the door, walks in. And suddenly, the agents jump on him. Zuckers is fighting for his life. He managed to rush through the door. And the most horrendous fight takes place. One jumped him and they immediately threw him down. He fought like a lion. All these young Mossad agents were all being, you know, held off by Zuckers. Zuckers reached to his own gun. A hammer is produced. Zuckers pretty much crumples, but he's not dead. He started shouting, let me break him. Let me speak. And two shots are fired. Into his head. And that was the end of Herbert Zuckers. Agents in underpants, covered in blood, looking down at the hangman of Riga. He was gone. The plan to incapacitate Zuckers and read aloud the judgment against him was abandoned in the struggle. They had prepared in advance a huge trunk. He was put in a box. They attach a note to his blood-stained body saying, considering the gravity of the crimes of which Herbert Zuckers is accused, notably his personal responsibility in the murder of 30,000 men, women, and children, and considering the terrible cruelty shown by Herbert Sukus, has carried out his crimes, we condemn the said Sukus to death. He was executed on 23rd February 1965 by those who will never forget. He dressed up, and each one went his own way according to plan, and then they all make their way back to Paris. The job is done. Back in Paris, the Mossad team needs to get word out that Herbert Zuckers has been executed. We contacted paper agencies in Uruguay to tell them that the body of this gruesome murderer will be found in a house in Montevideo. He called a newspaper in Paraguay. The telephone call to the agency was received by a junior editor. Never paid any attention to him. And the people in the Mossad are waiting one day, two days, three days. Nothing happens. No one believes that this has happened. And in the meantime, uh, Zuckers' family are starting to get a little bit worried about what's happened to their loved one. This is the first time Herbert Zucker's son has spoken on television. For the first few days, we thought everything was normal. Then, after a few days, that's when we began to worry. So then, somebody called up another agency in Montevideo and gave them full details. And this time, one of the editors decided this is serious enough and called the police. Twelve days after the execution, Montevideo police find the maggot-ridden body in the trunk inside the house on Cartagena Street. The policeman opened the trunk, and there was Zuckers' body. It had bloated. It was an absolutely vile thing to look at. A thumbprint from the body matches the print on Zucker's passport. As intended, the news travels like wildfire. I was listening to the radio and heard they found a body in Uruguay. 
I caught this terrible feeling. A wave of anti-Semitism breaks out. Synagogues were burned down in both Uruguay and in Sao Paulo. There were lots of random acts of low-level violence, but there wasn't any sort of massive reprisal carried out. It seems Israel's message is heard loud and clear. Four days after the body is found, the German government reacts. They extend the deadline on prosecuting Nazi war criminals. But in Montevideo, police have a homicide to solve. The family showed pictures of Kunzel to the world's media. We gave them the picture that was taken at the airport. It was all we had. But it was too late. Interpol were uh, called in to try and find out who this Anton Kunzel was. But of course, he retreated back to the an anonymity of being a, a Mossad agent in some town in the middle of Israel. The case goes cold. It would be 20 years before the Mossad admits responsibility for assassinating Herbert Zuckers. I was very proud of the Israelis for doing that. Even though it was horrible, I thought he deserved it. We must always remember, we must never forget. Despite testimony from witnesses like Sasha Semenov, Herbert Zucker's family denies he committed atrocities against Latvian Jews. We have been waiting 60 years for some kind of proof against my father. If the world can't show any documents that prove his guilt, then declare him innocent. My family has been suffering their entire life because of these lies. To this day, the man responsible for Herbert Zucker's death has never revealed his true identity. Anton Künzler came back to Israel. Of course, his mustache was shaved off, uh, glasses thrown away. He continued to work for many years in the Mossad. They got their man, they did it efficiently, Morally, is problematic, but it is nevertheless brilliantly done. So it was, uh, in many ways, the perfect mission. I am very satisfied. It was never dull in a moment. <laughs>